Hi, everyone. I am Demi. I am the digital and social media editor for Indie 1023, and I am here with Fleet Fox's frontman, Robin Pecknold. How are you, Robin? I'm doing well, all things considered. How are you, Demi? I'm all right. Things are okay. It's a nice day outside, so, you know. It's a nice day. Yeah. So where, where are you at? I'm actually in New York. I'm in Manhattan. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. but you did you leave for the pandemic and then come back, or have you always been in New York? No, I came back here for the pandemic. I was recording at the studio in California, and then um, in early March, it was clear that the studio was going to shut down, and this is where I rent an apartment, so I came back to, to be at home. Oh, my God. Has yeah. it been chaotic? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, for sure. I mean, chaotic and, you know, very dark at times, but then very encouraging and, and you know, very... Um, I don't know, I feel like a stronger sense of community here maybe than I ever have, mm. um, which is which is cool. And um, so there have been small little silver linings, I think, um, but I haven't fully processed having been in lower Manhattan since March yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah I can't even imagine. I, I live in Colorado and so it's nice because I can get to the mountains or go hiking or whatever. Yeah. Have you been able to get outside during the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I have a car. I'm lucky to have a car here. Um, and in June, I ended up taking a bunch of like eight to 12 hour drives through upstate New York. Um, and other than that, I haven't been able to get out as much because as soon as that was over, then I was just in the studio every day trying to finish this album to get it out for the 22nd. I actually, I think I read somewhere that you did over 6,000 miles on your car, just driving around, getting inspiration yeah. and notes for this album. That's two insane. Two <laughs> oil changes in three weeks somehow. That's right. <laughs> I'm sure you took your car and they were like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, felt bad. I mean, my carbon, I got to buy some carbon offsets. It was, it was excessive, but I don't drive that much anyway, because I live in- I can't even imagine all the car maintenance. I barely do mine, so. Oh. <laughs> what were some of the most memorable stops that you made? I think the main one that I kept going back to was this place, Lake Minnewaska, which is actually south of the Catskills, so it's closer to New York City than, um, than a lot of other destinations up there. And it's kind of a, an alpine lake, you know, a, at the top of this mountain ridge called the Shawangunk Ridge. Um, that's really kind of special for the region and feels more like you're in Colorado or something. Obviously not as grand, grand but it has kind of a, a western um, feel to it if you're if you're driving in the right area. So I would just kind of gravitate towards that zone because it just reminded me of the west, you know. And uh, I'd take these long looping drives and end up in Minnewaska and then loop back around somehow. It's nice to like have that nature -y area not too far from New York so when you want to get out you at least have somewhere beautiful to go so that's cool. Yeah and New York has this great system of parkways that they you know the first highway systems in, in the states um, and they you can kind of leave the city and not see a building within about 10 minutes because you're on these parkways that are just surrounded by trees and and it's actually like a pretty great infrastructure because I'm used to Seattle where you're just crawling on I-90 or something all the way yeah out to the mountains and it's just through suburban sprawl and and it's it's weirdly like not like that here that's a hot tip i've actually never hot been tip. in new york yeah. so this is good to know <laughs> i think that's one of the things that i worry about the most there i'm like where's the grass where are the trees <laughs> it's here it's here even in manhattan there's plenty of there's fort tryon park there's there's you know there are little pockets little pockets of green <laughs> Well, I want to talk a little bit more about Shore. So Shore dropped late September. It was a surprise release. Was that planned? Was it spontaneous? It was planned like in July. I think once it was clear that the album could be done by the end of August, then it was, then it was the question became like, okay, it can be done by the end of August. I would love for it to be done by the end of August because I've already spent a year and a half on it and a ton of money and I'm you know, even if it comes out in 2021, I would still like this to be done. Do I want to sit on it for eight months when we're entering this completely unknown territory? Mm. Uh, you know, possible third wave and a possible re-election and, or is there a way to just put it out now and just kind of uh, let the music, you know, serve, serve a role for some people if they were excited to hear it and, and um, you know, 
catch a pocket of time when, you know, it won't feel like the album is completely tied to the events of 2020, but also oh. before getting into this really unknown period. So um, to me, it just kind of felt like the only way to really do it in, in a way that felt really exciting, you know, and it's not like there's um, a big tour anyone can do, you know, so yeah. for that doesn't make sense, didn't make sense to me. And I've got nothing but time now to work on more songs. And and um, so it, it, it kind of just, that was really the only way that that it ended up making sense to do it. Yeah. yeah, it's it's interesting that you say that because I feel like it was released during so much chaos, but honestly has been such an outlet um, for people during these really stressful times. I mean, yeah, it's it's great. It's yeah. It's been such a positive release. <laughs> I, I, that means a lot because I mean, that is how it was feeling working on it in July, August was like, you know, it was having the way it was coming together and how kind of like, you know, I don't know, productive or healing it kind of felt to be working on music in that way. It was like, well, it's, maybe some other people will feel this way when they just listening to it. So let's just, you know, give it to them. Yeah. I actually listened to this album for the first time when I moved into this new place. And um, yeah, it was perfect. It was great for fall. It was such a warm album, very hopeful. And just how the sound filled my space was just yeah. so beautiful. And I was just wondering, what do you feel like is the general sound of your album? Um, I, you know, I think I was trying to find, yeah, kind of a, kind of a, obviously that, that was another thing, you know, I wanted it to be kind of a late summer into fall kind of, or into early fall kind of, you know, still a little warm, but there's a chill in the air kind of feeling to the music and, yeah, I wanted the guitars and everything to be like a little bit, um, you know, imperfect. And I wanted the, um, you know, drums to be really strong sounding, but then there to be these kind of waves of, of kind of lush music kind of passing over the drums. A lot of counterpoint between the instruments, you know, like different melodic lines happening against each other between the vocals and the instrumentation. And, um, you know, just kind of a, like sun bleached kind of, um, I don't know, slightly overexposed, just, uh, yeah, just kind of a, 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 a golden kind of warm thing. Yeah, I like that you said some bleached. It does feel like a sunny album, but then you listen to the lyrics and they're pretty heavy. Um, were there any songs that were really difficult for you to write? Um, the only one that was like, well, that, that was the weird thing with the lyrics because they were all difficult to write because I had no lyrics for any of the 15 songs for mm. like, a year and a half and then wow. it wasn't until June that I got any lyrics going and um, you know the it was it was because the music I, it was so bright that I was having a lot of trouble kind of finding words that could go along with it that didn't either didn't like you know didn't push it push the music over the top into being like too corny because it's kind of a, a balancing act or a tightrope walk with music like this more so than with really like guarded dark music you know yeah. it's hard to kind of like you know there's i think people equate serious music with dark music and i i think on this mm -hmm. album i was trying to kind of um prove that that's not true at least prove it to myself or something so the lyrical approach kind of like it started with the song featherweight you know and that song was really about kind of watching everything that was going on and feeling like lucky and feeling like my problems ultimately, um, you know, are just minuscule compared to, the, you know, compared to what's been going on and, you know, not just in 2020, but for, for a long time. And, and it's, um, I think that that kind of, that, um, you know, the lyrics kind of, hinging on certain realizations like that and depicting them i think that became how the you know it's like acknowledging some darkness at the same time that you're you're you know celebrating life in the face of that that became the kind of you know the layer of extra layer of depth that that made the music kind of worth finishing i guess yeah that's interesting. Do you usually write, um, like produce the music before you write your lyrics? Usually I start with the melody first. And so, and then, you know, whatever weird gibberish syllables kind of, uh, you know, 
bloom out of that, you know, because sometimes certain syllables want to be on certain notes and, you know, certain phrases need to move a certain way and with, mm. you know, when you're writing a song or writing a melody or a chord progression. And then I'll kind of do the Tetris work later of, you know, fitting that into, a, fitting an idea in there and then fitting those, that idea into words in the, that fit the melody. But, but usually in the past, I've had like small little solo tours to do, like opening mm. for Joanna Newsom. Mm -hmm. um, and so that had kind of in the middle of making an album and that would force me to finish more words than I actually had to force, finish this time because there, there were no shows like that this time. Yeah. Well, I want to talk a few, a little bit about some of the individual tracks that like stood yeah. out to me and one of them being Sun Blind. Um, so the track talks a lot about some of some artists that were inspirational to you that have since passed and some of them pretty tragically. And obviously with the tone of 2020, also a lot of death, a lot of sadness. Um, when you were writing the lyrics for this song, how did you process that grief? And how has the album, how has the songs uh, reflected upon you since its release? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that was the last song, you know, that's my favorite. So that's my favorite song on the album. That's the one that's most important to me personally. You know, I feel like I'm a music fan before I'm a musician 100%, you know, it's so much, a, um, so much of making music is kind of, you know, this intentionally or not, you're kind of carrying memories forward. You're carrying people, you're keeping people alive and you're carrying people forward and you're, you're, you're honoring your heroes in one way or another. Um, and I think like, you know, some of the, you know, when Elliot Smith passed away, when, uh, when I was a teenager, I put up like 300 pictures of him around school and just said, Elliot RIP, you know, um, cause I was such a huge fan and I was so devastated. And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the same impulse for that song. It's a, it's a similar thing, I guess, you know, just, um, having, you know, musicians I loved passing away recently and, and just trying to understand how to kind of um, honor them or like celebrate them in a way that felt like, you know, had kind of like joyous for, you know, finding that. Cause you know, I think about someone like Elliot Smith, if Elliot, if I, if Elliot Smith were still alive, I wouldn't want him to be, you know, making sad music still. I'd want him to be like living his best life and like, you know, uh, yeah. You know, we get to see him on stage or, you know, whatever, whatever it would be, you know, we'd still get, get that way. I, I, I wish I still had that. And I wish he, he'd gotten there, you know? So yeah. I think when I think about honoring someone who's, you know, sad music meant so much to me, I wanted to do it in a way that was kind of like living it now, you know, in a joyous way that, cause he's unable to, you know, he's not around anymore, you know? And I think that that, um, you know, that, I, I think that the get the privilege of being alive, I think it, it makes a lot of that. I feel privileged to be alive when I consider someone like Elliot, you know, the guy who doesn't have that, who doesn't have that opportunity anymore. And that makes yeah. me feel an own, there's an onus in that to kind of make the most of it, you know? I love that this song was, even though it felt sad to me, it was a celebration of life. And I feel like that was so needed, especially in 2020, just everybody has gone through so much. Um, 100%. Mental health problems, the politics, just all of it. And so, um, yeah, for me, that's why it sounded so hopeful. So that yeah. song is excellent. One Thank of my you. favorites on the album as well. Thank you. Um, let's talk about um, one of the standout singles. So Can I Believe You, which I think the video is getting released. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, today. yeah, I'm stoked to see that. So that's going to yeah. be cool. But yeah, we've been spinning Can I Believe You on indie nonstop since the single's been released. Well, thank you. But um, what stood out to me when I first heard this song was all of the different voices on it. So can you tell me who sings the vocals? Yes, um, some of the la layers of vocals are uh, the singer named Duwade Akere, who actually sang Waiting in Waste High Water, the intro song to the album. Just beautiful. a singer, beautiful voice, beautiful person just a great person um you know uh, so lucky to have her on the album and you know um so she she added some of the vocals on can i believe you kind of on the same day we recorded waiting to waste high water mm -hmm. and then um the other ones were all con like sent to me by instagram followers last year i 
kind of recorded each of the clips, we, each of the harmonies, and then I asked people to send send their versions in, and then ended up getting like four or five hundred submissions, and and um, they, you know, Beatrice Artola, the engineer, and you know, uh, mixer on the album, she spent way too much expensive studio time editing those together. I and can't <laughs> even imagine. <laughs> This kind of big chorus of, of, of fans, basically, which I thought was funny because the lyric is a little bit, you know, an artist talking to a fan. You could hear it, you could interpret the lyric that way, that kind of relationship, like, you know, can I believe you when you say I'm good or, you know, and the, and the, so the singer is kind of, um, you know, saying that, and but the vocal is being kind of cradled by this huge team of, of um, contributor fans, you know, that's one way to interpret that lyric. And so I thought it was that was a funny kind of irony in the arrangement that reflected the vocal, uh, reflected the lyric a little bit. Yeah, it's it's interesting hearing that song, but also hearing some of the other tracks on the album because it's a serious collaboration, and you've created uh -huh. such a community behind the album, which I also feel like just gives it that warmth and that hope. Um, because yeah, it's 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 interesting to have all of these different voices contributing to it. I remember hearing Wade open the album and I was just like my jaw dropped because one her her vocals are stunning and the song is so beautiful but just the creative decision to have this black woman um, open your album and then have this chorus of children and yeah. your followers and just all of these things it just was it spoke such wonders like to my heart because I was just like look at all of these people look at this collaboration and it was just yeah. it felt like a celebration which was really nice for sure I mean that was what you know there, I got derived so much energy from that and working on it you know just all the people I was asking to contribute because it is a you know big team of collaborators and contributors on this album mm -hmm. and I was acting kind of as the producer you know I wrote all the songs and lyrics I you know a ton of the music is me but but you know, it was so much more fun to be on the producer side, you know, asking someone to come in and, and, and getting, you know, helping get the best takes out of them and talking about what the best approach would be and, you know, reaching out and, and getting, you know, remote contributions from people like Kevin or Hamilton's kids in the mm -hmm. middle of the pandemic. And, and it was a real, you know, you know, this wasn't an album where I was recording every instrument myself and uh, engineering it myself or, you know, anything like that. It was a very, very community oriented project and I, I I love being in you know I feel lucky to be in the position to kind of like be able to ask people to do these things and and make these make these you know very collaborative songs um, and and that's like I get a lot of uh, joy and, and derive a lot of energy from that well I think you've given a lot of people joy with this album but uh, I want to wrap up with a few other questions that aren't super music related but <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> I am fascinated with the um, how interactive you've been in quarantine on your socials. Yeah. It's been so cool to watch you interact with your fans. <laughs> you created quite an online community and it's yeah. like really fun to watch you just interact with people. It's so fun. Cool. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, I think especially this year, it's been, you know, I'm definitely on my phone too much, but it's been a great source of like connection and, and kind of, you know, I think for a while I was confused about how to use social media because <laughs> so much of it is a bit, you know, I'm not big on like Twitter or anything, but I like Instagram, but Instagram is a lot of kind of, there, you, you know, you can, it, can, it can be a lot of kind of like lifestyle mm -hmm. uh, photography and, you know, making your life seem a certain way. And that just didn't feel like natural to me, but. So you don't want to be an influencer? Not an influencer. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I think this thing of like make sharing memes and like these weird things people will, you know, send me or <laughs> Oh my god. Of me or, um, you have so many meme accounts dedicated to you. It's insane. But so it's also it, concerning. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, I mean, for me, it's, it's just, you know, it's very fun. <laughs> what are some of the wildest memes that you've seen about yourself or about fleet foxes um well a lot of them come from like the there's like a a group that calls themselves the fleet foxes latinx gang and they're all yes. and they, have a, they have a couple accounts like fleet foxes underscore latam like they're all living down in chile or peru or brazil and 
and they make the the funniest ones um sometimes in spanish and and uh sometimes not but you know ones of me like riding a alligator or <laughs> there's this whole thing about you know me trying to make sure people hold shopping baskets a certain way uh i think they, that's the most recent one I saw. yeah uh they all kinds of just weird you know or adapting uh, you know normal meme templates into like working me into them or working the songs into them or someone made like a five minute video of me clips of me as if i'm the amazon alexa <laughs> and like added that into like an alexa commercial i need uh, to find it that one is, <laughs> is a real masterpiece yeah honestly this is art <laughs> just oh, I think time so. and dedication <laughs> i think if i were in school right now i would be studying meme culture i think that that's like a whole new language you know there has to be a class you I'm went sure. to columbia though for a bit did you get your degree uh i had a couple semesters left i thought about going back this fall but um I, I'd, I'd rather do it in person yep mm -hmm. yeah. well um i am excited about all of the stuff that you've been creating on socials are you going to create a TikTok? that that i think is a bridge too far <laughs> <laughs> i don't know Dude, that's a that's a different world maybe in a couple years when it's over yeah <laughs> when it's over <laughs> you're like the last person to come in and yeah. like it gets shut down and totally. yeah <laughs> well i want to thank you again robin i really appreciate this and um make sure that you go and stream shore on every single platform that you can buy some shore merch get a shore tattoo all of that and um yeah if you want to get more sessions at home just make sure to tune in to indie 1023 and follow us on our socials. Um, bye. <laughs> Thank you so much, Demi. Thank you. Yeah, everyone. of course. Bye.